Hello everyone and welcome to our first episode of the Student Symposium. So the idea behind this playlist is that we want to talk about political issues but have multiple people with different viewpoints on. So we have a few people from Odin as well as some guests. I'll start off by introducing Eric. Hey, how's it going? I'm Eric, the president of Odin. I introduced myself on the last podcast, so I'll pass it back. Great, Eric. Oh yeah, and I'm Rich, by the way, and we also have Guzal. Hi guys, it's me again. I'm the vice president, and you should remember all my details from the first episode as well. <laughs> Assuming you listen. Assuming and you <laughs> paid attention. We also have our friend Jake on. Hey, I'm Jake, guest today. Mm-hmm. Would you mind uh, telling them a little bit about like your major and what you're studying? Yeah, so I'm a sophomore here in computer engineering, minoring in music technology, and I'm from Northern Virginia. Great. Thanks, Jake. And we have two members of the Political Science Club here. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Kristen. I'm the secretary of the Political Science Club. I'm a sophomore here at Tech, and I'm getting a triple degree in political science, public relations, and public and urban affairs. Uh, Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm the event coordinator of the Political Science Club. I'm a sophomore computer engineer at Tech, and I'm only getting one degree. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, guys. And as someone who's not familiar with the Political Science Club, I'd love to know a little bit about it. Um, so we're a nonpartisan group, um, and we really are just here to engage students in um, the political environment and just start some good discourse on um, what's going on in our country. Okay, so like bipartisan discussion so you can get two viewpoints on everything? Yeah, pretty much. We welcome all points of view. Yeah, and they host events and stuff like that. Like I went to the uh, Politics and Popcorn last night pretty sweet learned a little bit about Zimbabwean politics it's like my third favorite thing of all time so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a little curious uh, why did you guys end up joining the political science school what were the motivations behind that well um so like politics doesn't really fall into my major but I'm um, so I, I can't really learn about it in class but I'm really interested in it I've always have been and when I came to tech I was already looking for a group that's not really aligned with any party per se but still discusses the issues, and I found a home, you could say, at the Political Science Club, where I found the discussion I was looking for, all the events, people I can actually talk talk, uh, about politics to, because most people don't really like to talk about politics these days. Yeah, we we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I was telling Ben, it's funny that we started up this club mainly to have discourse, talk about like politics and philosophy and stuff, and we had five founding members, and it was kind of funny that three of the founding members were physics majors because I feel like a lot of things get really specialized today and you just end up not paying attention to half the world and you get people who are like doing logic all day and that's all we get to do and we're kind of starved for discourse and communication. That's part of the reason why we started this, right? To promote civic engagement. We want to make you guys care and we want to make you guys voice your opinions and have these discussions because they're really, really beneficial. Yeah, or just kind of like let it out. Let some of your thoughts out in a good way. Was there any expectations you had with joining the club? Like, I guess, what you wanted to get out of it or what you'd like to see out of the political science club? Well, for me, I didn't really have much expectations I just wanted to have a, a fun environment first first of all I thought it was going to be a much bigger club which I was kind of afraid of like I thought a couple hundred people coming every time which obviously is unrealistic but I was young um but it's a uh, it's uh, if I as a, was last year <laughs> it doesn't matter I was a different man at the time. um Same. but um it's uh, it's like because our members, we we we're not we don't we're in a huge club like fifteen to twenty members, ten people coming. It, oh, it almost feels like a small family just sitting down, talking about discussing things in the world. I don't necessarily know if I I came in with the expectation that there were going to be a couple hundred people there. Um, I did think it was going to be a little bit more daunting than it was. Um, the environment's really open, and I would say that we're pretty welcoming. I mean, at least I hope that we are pretty yeah, welcoming. I'm pretty sure we are. <laughs> um, in the sense that like it doesn't matter if you dissent from the popular opinion in the room, because um, even if we don't agree with what you say, the thing that you say still has value in it, and understanding the other side of the Um, argument can help you understand your side as well so I think that it's a very welcoming environment which I was I guess a little afraid it wouldn't be when I first went last year yeah that's good it sounds like you guys really have like that healthy competition environment going there's you can have unhealthy competition for sure where people are just screaming each other down and that's nothing gets done but bringing like the competition knowing the other side hearing the other side and things like that actually improves you it it makes you sharpen your skills sharpen your thoughts 
I, I think the the thing that actually makes a difference in the club is because not we're not affiliated with any party, and most people who think about politics think about two sides because of the two party system. But um, in the club, we have a couple of people who would maybe identify on the same political side, liberal, conservative. But still, there's a lot of gray area. They in that club, they can disagree on a lot of stuff. It's uh, on a lot of stuff. It's not them versus us. It's more of a more of a kind of a big bowl of discussion, and there's more more nuance to the whole thing. Yeah, I said bipartisan earlier, but I think I'm going to start saying omnipartisan because it makes me sound smart. <laughs> it does. So one of the questions I had on my mind is somebody who doesn't pay a ton of attention to politics, as members of a club like this, how much interaction with politics do you find is healthy? I mean, as a political science major, I engage with it during all of my classes, and then I go home and read political news. So um, a good portion of my day is spent engaging in politics, which I don't necessarily believe that the average person should try and attempt to do that because oftentimes it can be overwhelming and I feel like people, it'll just turn people off from it. So I think it's one of those things that as an active citizen, you need to participate in politics, but not to the point where you're going to be turned off by it so that you might not participate in the future. Yeah. I mean, obviously I don't really meet uh uh, in counter politics in my classes but for me i think i definitely view it too much like I, i'm kind of on it all the time whenever i can check on stuff and that's de definitely not the optimal for most people but i think uh, if people just uh just use a couple resources to check on it more than like you know just a couple bits and pieces they hear from random people then i think that's healthy for everyone yeah well what about you jake as somebody who's not in the political science club so is that uh, directed at how much I'm involved with politics. Yeah, like how much, like, I mean, I don't want to get too quantitative with it, but like <laughs> how, much, how much time, like a day do you spend, like just like reading the newspaper or listening to a podcast about it? So I'm poor. I can't afford newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't have a newspaper here. So my exposure with politics largely comes through keeping up with media news and twitter news which sounds shallow yet is not shallow at the same time so i would say pretty much my entire twitter feed is every single major news network liberal and conservative and a lot of what i'm doing is reading through different opinion pieces and such on contemporary issues so that's how i keep up to date with it and i also i know a lot of people who are in uh, young americans for freedom at this school and uh, that's one of the big conservative groups. So I talk to them, too, about politics all the time just because they're uh, personal friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, like, I have to read the same story from, like, three or four different newspapers to try to really get, like, what's actually kind of going on. It can be hard to find out. There's a lot of different viewpoints and a different... Uh, there's a ton of places to go and find news. So personally, where do you guys... What sources do you guys like to use? Well, I have, like, um, for breaking news and whatever, I have, I think, a couple of the major news network news networks, like CNN, I think Fox, uh, as a notification on my phone, so if actually something huge happens, I'll see it as a push notification. For reading news itself, I don't really prefer establishment media, you could call it, the old you know, news networks. I'm a big champion of alternative news networks. That sounds really weird. But what I mean by it, podcasts, radio shows, more of the upcoming young people. Like, what I listen to a lot is the the Kai Kalinsky show. Um, he's a left leaning, definitely left leaning, but a young uh, guy who goes through most of the political news every day. And uh, I think he's very balanced in his opinions. Like he doesn't sway one, one way or the other. And I think uh, internet media is going to be the new wave of looking at politics because that's where the young people are, either on Twitter, Reddit, or YouTube. Did you say intermedia? Uh, uh, like uh, I'm not actually not sure what I said. I mean, like a uh, uh, a new uh, yeah internet media per se. Oh okay, internet media. Because okay. <laughs> I heard sorry. intermedia, I was like kind of like intermediate, like a person who goes like like that person <laughs> yeah. you mentioned to listen to a lot of sources and kind of like boil it down for you. How about yourself, Kristen? Um, I'm more in favor of traditional news sources. I also have um some push notifications like AP and PR. So if something big happens during the day. Um, it'll just buzz my phone and I can look at it and then choose whether or not to read it. Um, when I actually delve into the political news of the day, um, I tend to just do a quick sweep over, um, I, if it's a big, like, partisan issue, I'll read, like, um, CNN and Fox just to, like, see the differing opinions, but for the most part, I like to keep it to, like, AP, The Guardian, Washington Post, New York Times, 
um, things like that that are a little less biased and a little more fact oriented unless if it really is one of those partisan issues and then try to understand the sides from the differing scope of things okay that makes sense earlier because you i said how you had you said how you spend a lot of time on different media sources and i was curious how you could look at what's going on every single day and not let that absorb you too much but i guess if you have a balanced view by looking at different sides you don't get too absorbed in one area and you can kind of find this nice middle ground I mean, I guess that's the idea of it. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, I, I just sit in my room all day and read political news, but I, I do try and keep up with it. So, like, an hour a day of reading political news outside of classes. And then my classes mostly discuss a lot of political news. So there there is some of that, like, it's not all a personal decision for me. Uh, I think being our majors really helps, too. Um, to remind you guys, I'm National Security and Foreign Affairs. And for one of my classes um, in my earlier college career, w- they made us subscribe to the Council of Foreign Relations daily news brief. And I just kept it af- even after the class ended because it's really helpful. It's not too much to read. And it gives, just gives you a daily rundown of the major events of the day in, I, I think, in an unbiased way. But personally, I also like Al Jazeera, RT.com. Um, Guardian, everything like that. Guardian's great. Yeah, it's something like I kind of want to see more of, or I want to see companies step up and do like rate bias or like review bias. Like I've seen a few polls and studies that try, try to assess bias and like rank journals by that. So you know if you're getting more partisan stuff or not, but it's not really public knowledge yet. If that makes any sense. Well, that's the issue. It's like taking something qualitative and making it quantitative. It's yeah, it's the ultimate. It's fuzzy. Yeah, extremely really fuzzy. fuzzy. So before we dive into any of the issues that we wanted to talk about, one of the things that we wanted to foster by starting this podcast was open communication and creating a form of dialogue where it's less divisive and less tense. So one of the things I'd like to implement for this discussion is whenever someone says something that maybe you disagree with or you'd like to clarify a little more, it's helpful for me personally, and I'd like to implement this, to try and repeat the other person's point back to them, just to make sure you can kind of understand where they're at. And then once they give you the okay, like, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, then maybe make your point, and then we could actually, hopefully by the end of the discussion, have built something. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you guys too, do you, at the political science club, when you're having debates or discussions, anything like that, do you guys have kind of like rules, or not rules so much as guidelines, for discussion that you follow or like just societal norms i guess i mean just don't be a dick like yeah. that's a pretty yeah. like, like obviously you can speak up and like um i i i do agree that sometimes maybe it goes a little bit too far you could say but i'm fine with heated debate because that means people are, are interested in it and not apathetic if you're not going to become disrespectful to the other in a way that actually hurts someone you're not you're not going to be petty or sexually you know go a completely other way but i think it's fine to have heated debate just there there's a line I think it's it's a I think most people are at the club at least are pretty familiar with the line. It's 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 not something hard to just don't be just don't be an idiot. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't don't take heed of that. <laughs> yeah. I think common rules of courtesy and respect apply in every single debate. It's especially when it comes to politics. Yeah, and keeping the focus on ideas, not people. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, for sure. The idea is like that's what I would l- love to see if the general public would concentrate more on policy and ideas themselves than just them versus us, good or bad. Rather than than Id- their identity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Even down to a debate level with individual people, there's just a lot of ad hominem nowadays. Well, let's try to reduce that, and I guess we'll dive right into it. So, something on my mind recently has been the topic of prison reform. And an idea I came across recently that I'd like to bounce off you guys, I thought it was pretty interesting. So I think he was, I'm not sure if he was a clinical psychologist, but what he did was he's one of the people who does psychology work with prisoners. And he had a really fascinating viewpoint. So one of the things he pointed out was that our prison system's kind of based off of retribution. Uh, you go way back, what's the name of... Um, Hammurabi? Yeah, the Hammurabi's Code, where it's like an eye for an eye, right? And that's where our prison, where our legal system started and moved from there. And one of the things he pointed out was retribution doesn't necessarily make people want to reintegrate, right? Because when you do something, like let's say 
you get sent to a judge, and he looks at you and looks at the crimes you committed and says, okay, you did this, this, and this, and we judge it as being this bad. And then he looks at you and kind of assesses what the probability is that you'll act up in the future. And then from there, it, it depends if you go to, like, minimum security or maximum security. What he pointed out that I thought was interesting was what if we, and this isn't always the case, i.e., like, serial killers, but when you can, to try and look at it from a needs perspective and say, okay, so you robbed the 7-Eleven because you needed some money for your meth addiction. So let's get you to a prison that has, uh, you know, addiction councils and that kind of thing. Any thoughts on that? Um, I think that that's definitely a direction in which prisons should go in. If you look at a lot of um, Scandinavian countries like Norway and Sweden and things like that, I guess Europe in general, um, more like rehabilitation centers and things like that, which I think you see a lot of um, because most prisoners in America, I think it's like 40-ish percent, but definitely check me on that, um, are nonviolent drug users. So like mandatory minimums play a big role in that, which would play a big role in prison reform. So instead of just sending them to prison for five years, if you send them to a rehabilitation center, um, they're less likely to relapse, which means they're less likely to go back to prison and um, they're more likely to become productive in society. And then you would no longer have to pay for their, their prison sentence. I mean, um, yeah, Krista mentioned the, the Scandinavian forms of prison, you could say. Obviously, that's a, the complete opposite of what we do here in the U.S. And it's a, it's a different society, so you can't take everything at face value. But it's for sure true that they try to rehabilitate people much more than just punish them. And they have a very low rate of people actually falling back into committing crimes. So it seems to work. I think that that should be the first step of trying to do that for prison reform, then uh, maybe um, dealing with the idea of uh, private prisons, I think, would be very important. Because in my opinion, the problem with private prisons is they, for a pr- if you if you want to have a you know, private company and you want to have a profit margin, you want to keep people incarcerated. And that obviously doesn't really motivate you to trying to help them because if you keep more people in, you'll get more money. There have been cases where actually the state that I, I don't I can't remember which the exact example, but the state didn't let people out because then they would have had to pay uh, some extra money to the private company because they didn't stuff enough beds, and that's I think that's a problem morally. Yeah, definitely. I was actually about to just bring that up, and I have heard cases where there were judges receiving money for sending more people to prisons because they can do like these private prisons can do things where they have prisoners work for one dollar an hour or i don't know if it's exactly one dollar an hour but for lower than equilibrium wage and i am like a free market guy like i should i want to push everything i can to the private industry if they can handle it well but the thing is there's the private industry requires a profit motive obviously to continue to work and i think morally it is just not okay to have a profit motive lined up with somebody else's imprisonment. Like, we can have profit motives with plenty of things, but not with people's imprisonment. Now, do you think that there could be a middle ground? Because for me, this is one of those complex issues. It's that it, the difference between letting the market make something efficient and then trying to centralize it with rules. And it seems like there might be more of a middle ground we could find where we have private prisons, but possibly have much stronger restrictions. Because I have heard of like, like that one judge who got in trouble recently. Like, uh, he was getting paid off by the private prisons to send like kids to prison. Yeah. Like that's, that's mind-boggling to okay. me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that definitely with most things, you need to look at the compromise point of view. Um, because neither side's going to be wholly right in their assessment of the situation. Um, I think the real thing is like, um private prisons lobby politicians. Mm-hmm. So the getting the restrictions there is going to be difficult because, I mean, if private prisons are pouring money into politicians who are going to vote on this issue, the likelihood that they're going to even hear the bill is is slim to none. So I think that before that would happen, you'd have to see something change with, like, the Citizens United um, versus the FEC ruling. So, What what was that ruling? Um, yeah, corporations are people, and therefore they have the ability to um, freedom of speech, and within mm. freedom of speech is um, money. So right. uh, corporations can now get involved in yeah. um, politics, which leads to more lobbying, which leads to more mm-hmm. and they private interest in politics. So wait, they corporations are considered to be people under this, but 
do they have the same donation restrictions that people have? Because can't you only donate up to like a certain amount if you're a person, just a single person? If you're like, I, I want to say, which I'm Or does it going depend on who it's of, going to, I like a it, super PAC? Cause I, yeah, you're allowed to like, there are restrictions on it, but you can get around them pretty easily. But there used to be a lot um, more stringent restrictions on corporations that were kind of struck down by Citizens United. It basically said that you can't suppress you can't suppress free speech. So if corporations had X money to spend, you couldn't tell them how much they could spend on advertising because then you're restricting their speech. Mm. That 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 was the ruling. It, it's a it's an extremely controversial ruling. Like it's yeah, very, and very I, I, I think the Supreme Court is definitely gonna revisit that in the in the coming years. I mean, and even if we can't, like I think the private prison issue that's gonna take a lot of time to find a middle ground in. I think, as Krista mentioned, first would be the nonviolent drug offenders. Like, I think at least, like, 38 was the last number I saw of prison. And that just, to me, it doesn't make sense. I think at, right now, at this point, it's pretty easy to conclude that the war on drugs didn't work. It just made everything worse. And um, we, we definitely have to go about it by another way. Even if you don't want to legalize drugs, I completely get it. But uh, decriminalizing, in my opinion, decriminalizing at least marijuana would definitely help and retroactively letting those people out who were just who weren't selling drugs but just caught caught smoking weed or whatever and maybe you should let those people out let them reintegrate into society because we have we have an extremely large amount of people incarcerated we have more people incarcerated than china if i remember correctly which is just yeah if you look at the population numbers that's just absurd yeah and it's really important to especially with things like non-violent drug offenses to also clear the record in some way or at least like either clear the record or we just need less of a social stigma around it or less of a hiring stigma, I guess, because they, people who have nonviolent drug offenses can have a really difficult time getting a job and then they don't have anything to do. So they sit around and use drugs because they can't get a job. And that's just like creating vicious circle in society. And eventually go back to prison because yep. <laughs> their life doesn't work outside the of it. And then taxpayers pay for them again. Yes. <laughs> like. Yeah, but I think the discussion between nonviolent offenders and violent offenders is completely different when it yeah, comes to prison reform. Is. Yeah, yeah. We have, I do believe that rehab centers for nonviolent offenders are, are beneficial, but um, violent offenders, they do deserve the punishment that yeah. they receive. I mean, I, I think for those people, I understand your point completely. Maybe you could, in my opinion, maybe mix punishment and rehabilitation because, like, I think the end goal would be if, if it's a possibility to reintegrate people in society. I think people can change. I believe in that. But it is a second chance, as you could say. It sounds like a platitude. But I think mixing that, like uh, what we're for violent drug offenders, if it's a possibility, and I, I think we can evaluate that pretty well. Mm -hmm. If we can actually battle them and get them back into society, society, I think that's beneficial to everybody. Mm -hmm. so, second chances, yes, but definitely just a, sec a second chance. I think we should limit the number of times we say it's okay, you can come back because punishment does work. When when we speed and we get a ticket, we are we don't want to speed anymore and we don't want to get that same ticket again. I think it works the same way with violent offenders. If they think that they're just going to get a pass for doing something, then what stops them from doing it again oh yeah i i i, I, I completely agree yeah. i mean i guess the number of chances is effectively limited by your lifespan and the term <laughs> limits yeah but yeah, yeah. and also yeah. one of the questions i had too was you said like you know enforcement retribution works and it seems to but then you want to one of the things i ask is like okay when i want someone to do something for me what motivations do i want them to have and then they're, they're obviously like the, the motivation of fear it works but I, I think when it comes to specifically like nonviolent offenders, I think it would be much more helpful if we sent them to, if we base their term limits based off the rehabilitation they received. So if you're a nonviolent drug offender, when you go to see the judge and you get sentenced, you don't get sentenced based on how long we think you should sit in the slam or till you've like thought about, till you seem like you can come out a good person, but rather base the sentence off of, okay, we'd like to have you go through this rehabilitation program, this, this, and this. And once they can get to the rehabilitation program, then obviously this is a complex issue where they build metrics to see if you're rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. I think that could actually be really helpful for reintegrating nonviolent offenders. Another big issue I was reading about was that within prisons themselves, there's not a big emphasis on rehabilitation. 
a lot of prisons in the U.S. are mostly good at punishing people, and a lot of criminals who've gone through the system, like the prison system, they've been processed, coming out on the other side, aren't really wanting to reintegrate with society, and a lot of them even take extremely negative worldviews towards all of society for putting them through that and enabling that system to be in place. So a lot of them actually come out worse than when they went in, because they've built that hatred for the system. And they've also, like, discussed how to commit crimes a lot, (laughs) probably. (laughs) And I think you have to look at, like, with the incarceration rate, like, prisons are overcrowded right now. So it's not necessarily, like, some of the services that could be provided if there was an adequate number of people in an adequate um, prison. Maybe there would be more rehabilitation. Maybe there would be more programs that would assimilate them back into society. But with the incarceration rate that it is... We're just pushing more people into prisons, which mean they have less money to to do programs like that and um, less of a focus on that. The other interesting thing is, I mean, we have so many people in prison. It, It almost makes you wonder whether or not we're doing too much to put people there in the first place. And so, I again, I would go back to the question of why is it necessary and or beneficial to have any sort of private prison? Because... Honestly, of things that I've heard arguments for both sides from, I've never actually heard somebody defend private prisons. The best I've heard with um, the defense of private prisons is that states are inadequate in um, doing it themselves almost because it's so caustic, um, so costly and time-consuming and things like that that um, the private sector is more efficient at it, which also means that the private sector is more efficient in getting prisoners than the public because they have a vested profit interest in that um but some people do make the argument that they still have a better um efficiency rate and um a less expensive rate for prisoners yeah that's that's exactly what i was kind of saying at the beginning i was thinking about that too because usually the argument is that the private industry can handle things in a more efficient manner because they kind of have like the flame to their back trying to make a profit motive or they're out of business whereas you know government is always going to be in business until we collapse so usually it's better but yeah you can't line up a profit motive with imprisonment like that and i mean those as i I think i mentioned before like those profit motives are kind of lined up with the state the state kind like they kind of have a contract going on and the state doesn't provide enough people that sounds extremely weird but it doesn't provide enough prisoners then the company gets paid by the state in a way so that's how they're set up and there's just so many institutions where Americans have a societal mindset almost going into them that there needs to be some sort of economic model or some kind of break even where they look at it as like, what are we getting out of it economically? And in reality, there's just some things you spend money on and you don't get a return on investment because you just have to spend money on them. Like the military yeah. doesn't make us money. Yeah, it's like an autonomous it's money cost. in, no money out. Well, <laughs> when it comes to return on investment, though, <laughs> when you think about it, like, so let's say, ideally, actually, I don't know if it's ideal, but we reduce the privatization of prisons and the states take it over more, and then maybe you can create more rehabilitation. Like, yeah, costs have gone up. Well, I think maybe the return is people reintegrate in society. So there's an initial uptick in the cost of, like, creating more rehabilitation centers and reformatting the structure. But it'd be interesting to see the analysis of what a long term, of how that would change and like lower the recidivism rate, which is how frequently prisoners go back. I recently saw a statistic. I think ours is about sixty seven percent, compared to Norway's about twenty. But obviously, we're not like a small homogeneous country that's like in Europe. So, you know, you have to weigh things. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think that there's a like. I think we need to think about this in the sense that um, rehabilitation and private prisons aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, Yes, there are issues with private prisons and there are issues with um, a retribution focused um, prison system in general. But if you change the regulations, the market will adapt to those regulations. It doesn't mean that new problems won't arise from that, but you don't necessarily have to eradicate all private prisons in order to institute rehabilitation. Yeah, and so one really interesting moral question that I want to raise is a little context first. Over time, it seems like we've kind of shifted our mindset about what prison is supposed to do. Like, obviously, like way back to Hammurabi's code, it was straight up retribution. And now it's kind of more 
rehabilitation but to me there's also a like an effect like a pragmatic effect for keeping really violent people away from society obviously so where is the line for you guys where you think somebody can be rehabilitated and or or they just are need to be separated from society I mean, I, I think that's a really hard statement to make in any way regarding any person. Uh, I think, obviously, like, if, if you're a mass murderer, a terrorist, I don't think there is any really a way for you to integrate back into society. But there are definitely gray areas. Like, if you brought up somebody, hey, do you think a murderer can integrate back into society? Some people would say yes. They would say definitely no. It, it really dependent. That's why I think a, a, a psychological evaluation would be the best. I think I think psychologists and the people who study human conscious those are people who would be able to make a good good statement on this. I'm definitely not that not not well versed enough in the topic. I have hope in people, but there are obviously people who are just kind of ruled out. I definitely think it's a case by case basis, and you have to look at if if the crime was I don't know cir- circumstantial, out of need, or the reason, the motivation behind the crime. Uh, and if what either it was out of need or if if it was because they wanted to do it i think differentiating between those two will help us determine the line between are are, is this person ready to go back or is this person never going to change their mindset about whatever they did Mm -hmm. also I i mean it seems like the moral question actually i'm gonna have to disagree with you i think the moral question has a pretty straightforward answer the pragmatic implementation is sort of where the where the issues show up because i think a person's probably ready once they're psychologically stable and psychologically ready the question is how do you determine that and how do you determine that on a mass scale and how do you determine it how do you determine it fairly because i would argue to you that having a psychologist okay somebody actually isn't fair because then it's one person okay and one other person i think you'd probably need multiple of them to eliminate bias so multiple psychologists per person per every person in the entire system and there you have an extremely big logistical problem to overcome in order to do it fairly yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a really smart point yeah you i think you're completely right with that uh, can come to my mind the personal bias or like not every psychologist develops everybody the same way so i think there must be like a i'm not sure uh how to exactly get over this point i think the the science of psychology and that science can probably find out a way of like how many psychologists are needed what are the exact methods we can determine this i don't know if there's an exact set way right now um and i and i can see why you, why you bring up that point is definitely hard and then a lot of people would bring up if there is just a slight percentage of a chance that they might go back to their old deeds their old ways then why would let why why take that risk why, why, why let anybody out and that's a that's a that's a fair point that has to be discussed for sure hmm. so it seems like we're all in quasi agreement that this is an extremely complex issue that <laughs> maybe Definitely. maybe five college kids can't take on in a night so what i'd like to move on to next is the topic of guns something a little bit more maybe controversial between us and uh, i think eric had something you might have wanted to start us off with that possibly i mean yeah i could give it a shot yeah just guide the direction on it i'd like that yeah so i mean there's usually what i see with with gun control stuff is just mostly buzzwords and things like that like common sense gun control and things like that and I'm I'm definitely for like more gun control and things like that but I would just want to know exactly what people I just never hear any exact policy proposals or anything like that um universal background checks um not being able to get a gun if you have a history of mental Ill- illness mm-hmm. uh, a record should not be able to get a gun yeah um See, that's the thing, though. How, how do you define mental illness? Because, I mean... Diagnosed cl- by a doctor. But, like, what, what, what degree of mental illness are you talking about? Also, with the diagnosis, like, you don't necessarily have to divulge information that you and your doctor have discussed. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's so how Yeah, there's medical confidentiality things that are kind of in the way of that. But I do, like, I have heard the idea of like a close family member or friend being able to like call in to police or something and be like, Hey, I'm concerned about this person and I know they have a gun or something like that. And I think that's 
that's a really good idea. And that's tricky too because I definitely know people who are just so about their right to have a gun, almost like a principal thing at some times, yeah. yeah. that if they, if they learn that they could go to the doctor and possibly be diagnosed with a mental illness and then not be allowed to have their guns anymore, then they wouldn't, they go, would, to the they wouldn't go to the doctor, yeah. you know? And also I think you have to look at like the fact that some of it isn't necessarily new policies as much as actually enforcing the policies that yeah. already exist. Yeah. I mean, like, it doesn't matter what you regulate stores with. If I can go to a gun show and buy a gun like without any of these restrictions because no one's enforcing or checking if there is enforcement in these areas yeah yeah that that is gun shows are kind of ridiculous like (laughs) i'm i'm a gun owner and i'm for second amendment rights and all that but even when i was like before i was 21 and i couldn't buy a handgun or anything like that i was like i can just go to a gun show and buy one and that's that's kind of ridiculous like (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I completely agree. We got to enforce the current laws that we actually have. Universal background check would be great. I get people concerned about the what you guys said about the mental health part. I that's something that's got to be worked on. I think another thing that ha- may be looked at, and some people might some people might take offense to this, is what kind of guns are we selling civilians? Like, I think they're like I, I'm 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 not an anti Second Amendment uh, guy. If you're a listener, I don't want I don't want to take away your guns. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, but I do. I think we do have to think about like what kind of guns should civilians have. Like obviously, I've heard somebody like a year ago came up to me and he said there can be no limitations on the Second Amendment. And I was like, well, then you can have a nuclear arm head, but like obviously you can't. So the obvious limitations right now, you can't just buy a tank and roam around. Although that would be cool. Um, it's like you can't like, in Russia. <laughs> different there's a world. lot of things you can do in Russia. Different world Great for YouTube sure. Videos. <laughs> so like I think like. The AR-15 comes up a lot, yeah. for sure, because it's it's literally the the main character of mass shootings, if you want to say that, which we have had all, too much in the past, way too much. Um, so I think that maybe kind of looked at like, what do you need an AR-15 for? If you need a handgun to protect yourself, I can really get it. You need a rifle, you want to hunt. That's all fine by me. But what do you need an AR-15 for? The thing about like AR-15s is they would be the only type of gun that would allow an armed militia to stand up against a government that's encroaching and that was the original purpose of the second amendment yeah but like so that's but like that's not in the second amendment itself like i mean yeah i get the opposing the government part but like it doesn't matter what you have i don't think you can realistically i get the idea of it and when it was made it it, it, it's it it makes sense that idea Mm -hmm. of, of like like i get the rights having guns that's good and everything but actually standing up to the government i don't think in the current climate is realistic I mean, well, what about Viet Cong? Viet Cong kind of whooped our ass okay yeah, that's we, definitely true <laughs> i mean yeah but i think that you have to look at um and especially in western society the differences of those i mean going mm-hmm. into a differing landscape where you don't know the yeah. area is definitely a little bit different um also just newer technologies um so i don't know the feasibility of like a violent uprising against the government because i mean the government's not going to wake up one day and be like listen we're going to turn to tyranny i mean it's going to be a very slow process so i think more um civil engagement civil disobedience um the fact of being like we don't have this right but we want this right would be much more effective in changing the government than just a bunch of people with guns because yeah. just traditionally speaking especially in a country that they're familiar with and in the western in western society I mean if you look at like the black panthers and things like that like they're not traditionally as effective as just simply insisting that you have that right and doing it in a yeah. civil manner yeah i mean this would have to be very i mean things would have to go to hell in a handbasket for yeah something sure. like what i was talking about mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i i understand it as a hypothetical but if it if it ever did come to fruition at that point do government laws and regulations really come into play that's what i've always thought about too is yeah. like because there's so the black the black market argument mm-hmm. kind of cuts both ways mm-hmm. because it's like if you regulate guns more people are still going to get them like bad people are still going to get them on mm-hmm. the black market and it's like if you regulate guns more, then citizens don't have the possibility for armed uprising if there is too much encroachment. But the, they might get them on the black market anyways. Yeah. So it's kind of either way. People I mean, are but still like the idea that like we should necessarily not regulate something simply because someone could get it illegally. I mean, yeah. at that point, wh- like why have laws? Like people yeah, can yeah, illegally yeah. get weed. So why do we? 
like like just things in general like that i don't necessarily know if i agree with mm-hmm. it, it, i'm not saying i'm not anti I think it's a weak argument. i think it's a bad argument to say we should not regulate something simply because someone might do it because why why say murder is bad people still murder people yeah. like it just seems like a very it's a weak, weak argument, argument for in sure my opinion, and it cuts least. either way it, it yeah just... i think you can just apply it to too many situations where it would just fall apart mm-hmm. so i'd like to i'd like to take a take some time to talk about the actual second amendment itself because i think the main issue with gun control the way i've always perceived it is the second amendment it's not gun control itself it's the fact that the ability to have a gun in this country is not a law it's a right it's in the constitution and that makes it so that a lot of these arguments about regulating it in my mind actually go away so personally and i don't i don't study constitutional law but from the way i've interpreted it if it's if it's a constitutional right there can't be laws that actually infringe upon that mm-hmm. i disagree with that um just seeking from like um, there are restrictions to your freedom of speech. There are restrictions to your freedom of religion. There are restrictions to all of your fir- First Amendment freedoms. So not that necessarily there should be like just a complete overturn of the Second Amendment, but having regulations against the Second Amendment isn't necessarily... Because, I mean, if you want to look at like um, speech in general, it's if it presents a clear and present danger. So if you can argue for the Second Amendment that owning a certain type of gun presents a clear and present danger, then that actually supersedes the constitutional right there, and you have precedent on it from other simple um, freedoms granted to you in the Constitution. So then the question I would ask you is, what gun doesn't present a simple freedom or sim- or obvious presence of danger? I, and that's that's an argument that a lot of people take to the Second Amendment, that they all do uh, present a clear and present present danger i think that you really have to sparse between is it presenting a clear and present danger or is it i I think that there is a line there and i wouldn't necessarily say that as a 19 year old sophomore in college i'm probably the best person to say where that line would be yeah i think we did if if we actually want to get down to drawing that line we'd have to get deep into the statistics of homicide and things like that but that's there, there's a funny dynamic with these conversations because these conversations oftentimes come up around school shootings and it's kind of weird to me this might sound really horrible but there's a disconnect between like do we want to work on fighting the larger proportion of murders happening of of gun violence happening or do we want to try to fight the part that's like the most horrific to us but doesn't necessarily kill the most number of people like, I mean, we got to fight them both. So obviously. what you're saying is the but majority like, of murders are done by handguns, right? With gang violence and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like, yeah. And a lot of gang violence and stuff like that. But normally that stuff doesn't get really covered or people don't really talk about it a whole lot. I've actually talked about this with one of my friends who's in the, one of the conservative clubs here. And I've talked about this very particular issue with him a lot. And the thing that the conclusion I came to was that it's actually easier. It's not that it's more important to uh, try to address school shootings necessarily, but I think it's actually way easier to deal with them than it is to deal with handgun violence because solving the problem of handgun violence is extremely complex, whereas a lot of studies have shown that a lot of this school shooting stuff can be easily easily dealt with by like limiting restrictions to AR-15s, like actually clamping down on black market sales, making sure that people register guns and that guns yeah. are traceable, and then also increasing the age of ownership to 21 mm-hmm. in some places. I, th- I think this is a point that comes up a lot in, d- in gun reform and c- control discussions, but countries with strict gun laws don't have mass shootings like we do. We have so many mass shootings, more than any other country in the world, and... Is it due is that to per capita? Yes, yeah, I've checked that yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. Okay. And is it due to our lax laws? So I actually grew up in a country that doesn't really have guns. Um, I grew up in Europe, in Hungary, and we that you're completely right. We don't have mass shootings, and people. So I'm gonna take both sides on this. People like to bring up the Australia argument, right? Australia had a big 
uh, mass shooting. I think it's Australia, but check me if I'm wrong. And um, they just banned all guns, and there was no really mass violence after that. People like to bring this up in support of gun reform. And I don't necessarily agree with this with this point because uh, the culture of guns in America is much different than it was in Australia. As the same as you can't really make the same equivalency to Europe. We never really had a right to guns, you could say. Like, you can own a gun, but it's a much complicated process. You, It's just only handguns or stuff like that. So you can definitely, I do agree with the argument that there is a reason we don't have mass shootings in Europe where I grew up. and But here, but here in America, we do have a lot of them. It's it's not an equivalency per se, but it's definitely, definitely, um, def- you can definitely make the point that like, yeah, they don't have guns, they don't have mass shootings. That was obviously a correlation to it. And the black market argument that uh, I try to get back to that you brought up is most people can just go on the black market and buy a gun. Like, that's not how that works. Like, I could probably figure out how to get a gun from the deep web, but uh, anything I wanted. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> you're okay. on a list now. <laughs> no, you're shit. on multiple lists. I've now. already been on multiple lists. It's fine. I was gonna say if you know like a little bit of crypto stuff, it's not that hard to get pretty much anything you but want. But like now. crypto stuff is being like at least the deep web is being tracked much better than it was used to. Obviously, it's still not as tra- trackable as yeah. the regular internet. But I, like most people um, who buy their runs, like uh, some of the people who commit these horrible acts that bought guns that were bought legally, they would not be able to buy them illegally or they may, may be caught in the act of it. The other thing is that I don't think it's talked about enough is the mental health issue because I think that's another angle to it. We don't take mental health seriously enough in this country, I think. We don't have any. We don't have enough resources for it. People don't get the amount of help they need. And the other point is like we got to address the school shootings because when kids have to learn lullabies about how to run from a school shooter that's just completely fucked up there's also something inherently flawed by the fact that the cdc is not allowed to report gun statistics like just by law they're not allowed to report gun statistics that's so sketchy. the problem with like some of the gun statistics that we're getting is like we're either getting them from the nra or we're getting them from organizations that are completely and utterly against guns so i think like allowing the cdc in general to be like hey this is a a more i guess um a truer neutral yeah i, I don't know i assume you're referencing the dewey amendment uh, or, sure yeah i'm not entirely sure i just know that yeah the it was passed it was passed in the late 1990s by the senator who uh was yeah re- i think he was republican at the time the nra was like you know push this through and then the any congressional or public government institution was not allowed to report statistics on gun data yeah. and that's that's that it's still in place to this did, day did we just did people just like forget about this <laughs> well, oh no no, no, no it's, it's very it's very it's very publicized pretty yeah. much every time there's a school shooting that comes up people bring that up again yeah so yeah. I, I think that that's, that's a really big issue because like i don't want to get my news and my statistics from someone that's completely and utterly against yeah. any gun ever and i don't want to get my statistics from the nra yeah Go- going back to your gun culture point, um, I think saying the U.S. is a very gun-obsessed society versus other countries that have never had guns is also, like... Um, it's not the best comparison? Yeah, um, because I think gun control would be the first step to changing the way Americans think about guns and the first step to changing the culture that is so permeate- permeated with the second amendment you know yeah I, I completely agree with you on that i'm sure if it come up that way i'm just mm-hmm. saying when to the people who just want to ban guns because there, uh, there's a yeah. really small minority but when people mm-hmm. bring up uh, bring up the australia argument mm-hmm. they go with that and that's why i was yeah. saying that because the difference of culture that's not uh not that's realistic not feasible, or yeah, yeah. it's not feasible yeah. right now um but i do think it's a small first steps. step but i think it's, it's going to be engraved in the culture for forever probably because a lot of americans tie their freedom to their guns, you know, which is a founding idea of this country, of our country. So I think it's, yeah, the first step should be gun reform. And I don't think the culture itself is going to change. But if you look at statistics, even gun owners want to have at least background checks. It's just the NRA has a very loud voice yeah. in our government, as do other companies yeah. or organizations. And I'd love to see some more some more gun regulation tried out at a state level, too, and just trying more things out at a state level in general, because... I always think of the huge variety of people and cultures in America. Like, you, you're obviously not going to get anything through in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, like that's not going to happen. So we, we have this, like, country set up to run 
this almost controlled experiment it's not exactly controlled but we have this country run up to set this experiment where texas will have no gun control and maybe california will have as much as possible and we can see how it affects things over time and adjust our policy accordingly but we never look back at policy and really adjust for it i I think i just saw a statistic that california has pretty tough gun laws in comparison their their gun violence has gone down tremendously it's the last one I saw. It. I'm not sure about the numbers, but I did see a statistic about this. I think when the bar shooting happened, which was around a week ago, when yeah. it came out. I also, oh, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Oh, I haven't looked recently, but some of the statistics I had seen was that controlling uh, the amount of guns that the society can have, I think it was specifically in like the UK, didn't particularly affect the amount of violence because knives exist and other things to kill people exist. But also, I guess, I'm not sure if the... Uh, if in the UK and Australia, if the gun control issue actually was stronger than the black market in those countries. But so I'd be interested to see if introducing a policy that had stricter control actually reduced the violence. But it did in California, you said? Yeah, it did in California. And uh, yeah, it's like, um, yeah, sure, knives exist. And like, you can kill one person with a knife, but you can kill a hundred with a gun. Yeah, wait, can I jump Go in ahead. on your statistic there? Yes. That's true, but extremely misleading. Ah, okay. So the issue... The, I'm not even going to say the issue I take with that statistic. I think the statistic has an objective issue, which is that well, it, it taking away guns didn't decrease violent crime, but it did decrease fatalities and mass violent crimes. Ah, okay. So stabbing someone doesn't necessarily kill them. And also, when you're stabbing somebody, you better be stabbing somebody that's smaller than you. <laughs> <laughs> and has no that's other people tactic. around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you better be doing it at night, <laughs> and you better be doing it <laughs> far away from cops. So it actually did drastically decrease violent crime rate in cities, okay, in public areas, and drastically decreased it during the daytime, and it decreased fatalities. So Whoa. there was less death, less murder, but same amount of violent crimes. So that's why that statistic is interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it I make, read about that. It makes so much more sense to enact these things on a local or state level because it would make more sense to have heavy gun regulation in cities you know where you pack people in as close as possible and you know people get irritated with each other and there's a lot of of people there so like maybe it's not the best idea to have everybody packing heat but then (laughs) out out in the middle of alaska where they get airdrops for food Maybe we shouldn't outlaw guns. Maybe they need rifles oh, there. Yeah, to, yeah, for sure. That like, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. get that. The it's other just, huge... So there's, there's really fine gradations. I feel them. like the huge issue with that, though, is like intuitively it would make sense, but then you get... Anytime I argue with anybody on that issue, they bring up Chicago. Like, Chicago's the go-to. So Chicago, handguns are banned. They have a lot of violence. Like, you just can't... You straight up, like, in Chicago, it might as well be, like, Soviet Russia. You can't have anything nada yet they still have more violent crime and equitable murder as to when they did have guns why because everybody still legal still has guns they just don't have them legally essentially they're buying from around the place and then still having them and then this argument which i always say is dumb but basically people in chicago who would otherwise protect themselves are pretty much now unable to protect themselves and there's still a lot of violence in chicago so i have yet to find a good argument against that particular microcosm (laughs) i want to say this right before i leave because i gotta go soon but move being a foreigner of someone who had moved who has moved here in the last 10 years it was so weird to me how gun obsessed a lot of americans are i don't know if it's because i'm from a second world country and my people have other things to worry about but i did not um, I had never had a discussion about guns or gun control or gun reform before I moved to the United States. Not that it wasn't a problem, but it was. It is not ingrained into the identity uh, identities of people in other countries as it is in the U.S. I feel like that was very strange to me. And now that I've lived here for a while, I obviously I talk about guns a lot too. But <laughs> it's when I think back on it, I'm like, hmm, this was not a part of my life before I came here. Yeah. I guess one thing in the United States that tends to make this such a, an important issue is where I tend to see a lot of us not able to connect is like when we discuss 
the Second Amendment and the fundamental right of, be, of protecting yourself from the government. But to a lot of people, that seems like some lofty thing. Like, no, no, no. The government, they're Gucci. Like, it's fine. And like, <laughs> like you mentioned, like, it happens slowly, right? Like, there wouldn't be, like, tyranny overnight. However, that's where I would agree with you, but also use that to kind of disagree with you. It does happen slowly, and it happens at the level of slowly removing things from people. So it is a tricky, it's a tricky thing. And I don't honestly, like, I don't, I don't have a well-informed enough opinion to, to even start to draw a line in that sand between the philosophy of protecting yourself from the government itself, because that's how America started, right? We took our guns and we mm-hmm. uprose against the British, and now we're here, and it's so we continued that law. What I find to be really interesting about it is we so badly want to be able to protect ourselves from the government with guns, but we don't turn out to vote in high percentages. And that might sound like a strange thing, but like we're saying we need to protect ourselves from the government because government is in, is inherently going to try and take more power than they should, right? But, like, one of the checks on that, one of the biggest checks on that, one of the biggest checks that the founders instituted was allowing people to vote. Allowing people to be like, I don't like whatever the hell the government's doing, so I'm simply going to vote that person out of office. Like, we have the ability to fire politicians if we don't like what they're doing. So I think that that is a very interesting thing when someone's like, well, I need my gun to protect myself from the government. And it's kind of like, but did you vote in the last election? Which isn't necessarily tied to a gun debate in any way. I just think it's an interesting thing when we think about, because it's an interesting thing. One of the easiest ways to protect yourself from government is to become politically involved. And sometimes people don't necessarily do that because they're apathetic towards government until they believe that the government's trying to do something like take away their guns. Yeah, well, I think it also functions as a bit of a deterrent because if the government knows that the population is well armed, they won't really try to, they'll be less inclined to pull things. And like, especially when I hear, I mean, I hear a lot of people say, this happens probably every election now that it's gonna be the end of democracy. But if you really think that it's gonna be the end of democracy and tyranny's gonna be taken over, like you should be getting your guns. Like, but I, not, we're not there yet. But going back real quick to Rich, what you were saying, I think that's interesting and that might be why gun rights and like the gun culture is kind of more ingrained in america is because we were one of the first countries that was like started off an armed revolution and so our founders created our first amendment rights we were like what are the fundamental rights that humans need to live happy lives and then that was our first amendment and then they created the second amendment and said what do the people need to protect those rights but like i mean yeah i get that i get what you mean i think it's a but like it, th- those were much different times. You got every, every amendment, I think, and, and like at the time, you had to you had to take a whole minute to reload a gun. Uh, that's not, yeah. not the same anymore. So I think that's an issue. And you, like I think uh, gun owners, especially, are afraid of uh, government overreach. I think that's what like fuels a lot of it. But I think if you want to look at government overreach, it's I think it happening uh, in concern with other amendments, especially the fourth one right now, uh, like cybersecurity stuff, like NSA spying. So I think that's I get that, but nobody seems to be rising up for their guns and trying to go against the tyrannic government for that. Also, I I think I would question, does guns deter the government? I mean, I would argue that, like, not necessarily our legislatures aren't being like, maybe we shouldn't pass this because people have guns. I mean, I think that their their real fear in the power of the people is their ability to to fire them, to, to change the majority. You know, like, if we don't like what the majority is doing, we'll vote in the other party. I, I don't necessarily know if I would say... In definitely more extreme cases, maybe they would think about that. But in like day to day legislation, I, yeah. w- I would argue that they don't. Nec- that's not yeah. a conscious thought I'm that talking, they have. Yeah, yeah, this is this is very extreme stuff. This is that's this fair. is when this is when fundamental rights are being infringed upon, and that's why I kind of reference the First Amendment. To, yeah, it's to protect. But like, place. I mean, when the First Amendment comes into contention, don't we necessarily just go to the Supreme Court? I, like, like yeah. I just think that there are more checks in place for for that than mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that guns would serve as the deterrent. So I'd like to bring up two things regarding this argument. So my first one is that the same people who vote to keep guns are also the same people who vote to pour more money into the military. So they're giving they're giving the government more ability to tyrannize them 
and trying to protect themselves from the same government. So that's an argument I've never, ever, ever seen someone beat me on. Go, go for it if you want. <laughs> Secondly, I think that people who advocate for the Second Amendment actually under-advocate for it because back when it was made, guns were the end-all, be-all. That's the strongest the government had to fight civilians, and that's the strongest civilians had to fight the government. That's not the case anymore. Missiles, tanks, chemical warfare, planes, aircraft carriers, blah, 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 blah. Every AR-15 on the entire Earth would lose to one tank because it can't get through it. So I think the balance of power is so in favor of any modernized military that guns are quite literally like pencils versus a fire. I think a lot of people underestimate the power of a pissed off population rising up because I mean those at least to me those are kind of the coolest I mean, the moments British in history. Did. Yeah, 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 exactly. We if you ever read like like a Washington biography or something, the Revolutionary War was a shit show. <laughs> it, <laughs> it was an it was. absolute <laughs> shit show. And I mean, but it worked. Mm-hmm. And like I referenced earlier like the Viet Cong dug tunnels through the ground to hide from our bombers and like lure, lured our men into rat holes and killed them. Like there's, there's intellect, there's cunning, there's guerrilla warfare. If, if something is so terrible that you have to go to that extreme. But I'm going to argue that you can't win. All you can do is not lose. Hmm. You can fight a war of attrition long enough to get them to give up, and that's a win. And the other thing is, of. is we're making philosophical choices there. We could have leveled Vietnam in a day if we decided to. We could blow the whole thing flat. We have nukes. yeah. Well, hopefully the government won't want to completely level their so that's, country. So that's the thing is, it goes on a lot of hopefullys and a lot of hypotheticals that don't have good probabilities in okay. favor of, you know. So as we encroach upon our one hour here, I'd just like to maybe wrap it up a little bit and try to summarize where everyone's at. So it sounds like with this gun discussion issue, when it comes to the Second Amendment, where it really seems to be most valuable is at the fringes, right? Like if you're actually ever needed to protect yourself. And then there's the philosophical debate, like hopefully if the government did try to infringe on our rights, it would be with tanks and guns and not like a nuke on New York City. Who knows? But anyways. fun. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and then there's the question you raised too about like the fact that a lot of people that advocate for guns are in the military and they're actually pretty stand up individuals who would most likely stand up against their own government in a, in a sense so that'd be an interesting thing to see because like they've got civilian family members they don't want to see some kind of all out war of attrition Yeah, I, I, I did actually just to jump in a little bit want to bring that point up two points is like I think we would have defeated Vietnam if the public outcry wasn't that bad. Like, I think we would have stayed in the war. We would have eventually won that. Um, and the the other uh, thing is, is like, I think most of the military, like, I cannot speak, for, I'm not in the military, I cannot speak, but I think a big chunk of it would stand with the people and not with the government if the government was oppressing on it. And then it's a whole different issue. Mm. All righty. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you guys coming on. And before we end anything, I'd like to have you guys share how anyone who's interested in the Political Science Club could find you guys. Well, one, thank you so much for having us. Uh, it's, it's been real fun. Um, the second thing is uh, Gobbler Connect. Just search up Political Science Club. Um, apart from that, I'm the secretary, so you can email me. My, um, my email is kristt1 at vt.edu. We will put that in the show notes and put all the contact info we can. Thank you guys for listening and have a great evening or morning, whatever time of day you listen. I guess I'm biased because it's nighttime. Have a good one.